So I am thrilled to talk with you about this exhibition. I've been working on it for a year. I had the pleasure last year, almost exactly at this time, to go to London and see this show at the British Museum. The High began working about three years ago with the government in China to talk about bringing the Terracotta Warriors here to Atlanta. And while we were working on it, they, they said to Michael and to David Brenneman, you know, we've also been talking with the British Museum about this, and they're working on an exhibition, and we'd be very happy if you guys kind of connected yourselves up and worked on some way for those same objects to come to the United States. And so Michael contacted the director of the British Museum, and we developed a great relationship with them. And luckily, of course, at the British Museum, they've got terrific Chinese curators. And Jane Portal, their um, Chinese curator, was the curator of this exhibition. And we agreed to bring that story here to Atlanta. And we're lucky enough to be able to hire their associate curator when she finished her work. And so she's been working with us here at the High. And some of you, I know, are coming to hear Jane Portal speak on Saturday at the High. I think it's sold out, but it's really been an incredible thing working with the British Museum and seeing this show there. And I have to say it, I'm sorry if any of you went to London and saw it, but gosh, I think it's more beautiful here. <laughs> I am really proud of it. Um, I think it's our very best work. It's spectacular and dramatic, and I, I can't wait to hear what you all think of it when you see it. This is a really interesting version of the Terracotta Warriors show. How many of you, by chance, have actually been to Xi'an and seen them? So I thought there'd be a, a decent number. It's an amazing experience, which I have not yet had, but I hope to someday soon. Um, and usually when the Terracotta Warriors have traveled in the past, it's been part of a larger look at Chinese history, or maybe they were looking at several different dynasties. But this is an unusual show in that we're really looking at Emperor Qin, Shirwandi, and I've given you a little phonetic pronunciation of his name, Emperor Qin Shirwandi, his dynasty, his empire, and how the Terracotta Warriors are a part of that. So this is an opportunity to really look at the man, understand a little bit about what he did, what he tried to accomplish, why did he have this incredible tomb complex, and also to share with you all um, here in Atlanta some of the most recent discoveries at the site in Xi'an. And this is what's also special about this exhibition is that some of the things we're showing have never traveled to the United States and are discoveries that have been made in the last 10 years. It's really incredible. So if you haven't been to Xi'an in the last 10 years, there is something new for you. Just a few Qin, Qin Dynasty fun facts. Um, it was an incredibly short-lived dynasty, which is what's so remarkable about it, just from 221 to 206 BC. It falls between the Zhou Dynasty and the Han Dynasty in Chinese history, for those of you who carry all the dynasties around in your head. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the Emperor Chen was born in 259 BC. He became the king when he was only 13 years old, and he died in 210 BC. So we're not talking about a very long life but a really amazing amount of accomplishment. So let's get to know him a little bit. He came to power, as I said, at 13, and probably relatively soon after, um, decided to take on the mandate of unifying China. Because for about 400 years, I love this little pointer, all of these warring states had been fighting. Here's the Qin Dynasty, small and certainly not the most important of the warring states. And he began, over about a 20-year period, to fight and and uh, conquer all of these different states, and eventually was able to do it by 221 BC. Um, and that's when he became and named himself the emperor. And Qin, of course, comes from his culture, but Shirwan Di means divine and august emperor. So in 221 BC, he added the Shirwan Di to his title, naming himself the divine and august emperor. And divine's an important part of that, because he wasn't just saying, I'm responsible for all of this land in China, but he was saying, I'm close to the gods, and I am responsible also for the cosmos. And we'll hear more about that as we go on. So how did he do that? How did he conquer all of those warring states? And how, how had it not happened before then? Number one, the Qin warriors were accomplished horsemen, and the other dynasties weren't very engaged in a cavalry. And number two, the Qin dynasty perfected. This is the, very, this is the second object you see in the exhibition. It's very unassuming, and I've made it very large here. It's about, it's about this big. <laughs> it's very small. Um, but it's the trigger for the crossbow mechanism. It sits back in here. You can see it sits right in there. It's a little trigger. What he did was his people perfected the creating of these little triggers and also the points to the arrows so that if your crossbow broke while you were on the battlefield, you could quickly replace it 
this trigger mechanism, which is the most important working mechanism, or your arrow tip instantly. Everything fit. All of the parts were replaceable. And because they had created such a perfect mold, what you had was a warrior who was on the battlefield who could be rearmed almost instantly if his weapon was damaged, fighting against people who, if their weapon was damaged, were without a weapon. Um, and so this made them an incredibly powerful force. Second, it was an enormous army, estimated at at least 500,000 strong. He conscripted um, Everyone, every male had to at some point fight in the army. This is huge when you think about that. The, during the Roman Empire, some of the largest armies were 250,000. So in 200 BC, here he is with a 500,000 force army. It's, it's remarkable. So after he successfully conquered everybody in 221 BC, then he began to put a lot of standardizations in place. Because if you're going to have a successful empire, you need to be able to trade, you need to be able to communicate, you need to be able to protect. So he began to standardize things. And one of the most important was the standardization of the currency. We're very lucky that the British Museum um, loaned us a lot of different Chinese money. I just have one example here. Um, and then this is the more recent piece. But this is a, an, an older piece. This is from the Zhou Dynasty, and it's called spade money. So it's in the shape of a farm implement or a shovel. There was also knife money and ant money. Each little warring state, of course, had its own currency. Once they were unified, if they were going to be able to successfully trade and work together, they all needed the same currency. So the emperor created this coin, the circular coin with the square hole. Pretty amazing for an empire that didn't last very long after he died, only four years. This coin, however, made it until about 2,000. So how incredible. They were still using this coin. And in fact, the Bank of China still uses this coin as its symbol. So this is an amazing legacy. He also standardized the um, written language. So all of the characters, he created a, a, a written language that everyone could read. So while you might not have been able to speak to one another because your dialect was different, the written language, the language of doing business, was all the same. Again, that remains the same today. It's incredible. It's really incredible. And he was the one who really created the Great Wall. So we know the Great Wall today, and anybody who's been to China has walked on the Ming Dynasty version of the Great Wall, I'm sure. It's beautifully bricked and very wide, and we can see it from outer space. But it began in his time period, because if you think back to that map I showed you, each of that little warring states had their own defensive wall. And what he said was, we got to link all these up, our dangerous areas to the north, and let's connect them all together. This was a, an, a wall made of tamped earth, and over 700,000 conscripted soldiers and prisoners were made to go and link all of these walls together to create the first great wall. But this was the beginning of it under the emperor. And then somehow, I think most historians think he died uh, because he had become so afraid of being assassinated, he had been looking for an elixir of immortality. And he had alchemists creating potions for him, including mercury and all kinds of other poisonous things that today we know were not going to help you live forever. And probably on one of his trips, they know that he died when he was traveling, to look for more potions, he died. And they were very concerned about trying to get him back to the capital. And the little bit of history that we have remaining says that they, were, they wanted to get him back to the capital city so that there could be a more peaceful transition to his son. They didn't want anyone to know he had died. But the body began to decompose, and it was starting to smell. And so they actually got a big wagon full of fish and started traveling it around with <laughs> the carriage to, so that there would be something very smelly. Uh, and then, oh no, everything's fine. It's just he's in a fish mood. Uh, and so eventually he made it back to the capital. His son, his second son, took over, but that only lasted a very short three and a half years. And when he was buried, he was buried in this mound. So those of you who've been to the site know that there's this big mound that kind of looks like a hill out in the middle of a field. And that itself is the tomb of the first emperor. We don't know very much about it. Probably most of the records were destroyed by the Han Dynasty who followed. But a historian writing in the Han Dynasty, a hundred years after the first emperor's death, wrote about what he thought was in the tomb. And it's very specific. And he talks about the first emperor being buried there, that on the ceiling, all of the stars of the heavens 
all around him were the rivers of China made of mercury, all of the land, and that any concubines who hadn't borne him a son and everybody who built the tomb was sent in and sealed up. Crossbows were lined up so that if you tried to get in or out, you were going to be killed. We don't know because nobody's been in. As far as we know, nobody's been inside that tomb. What we're going to talk about tonight is the 23 square miles around it that were the tomb complex. But the tomb itself really still remains a mystery. So probably most of you know that in 1974, four farmers, I think there's one still at the site. Did anybody get their book signed by him? Or yeah, <laughs> he's very busy there. And he, I think he charges, right? You got to pay him. Um, but I think he's required to be there. <laughs> and they found the edge of one of these terracotta army pits. And this is a very early photograph. And you can see these soldiers just peeking out as they're beginning the excavations in 1974. To date, in 2008, remember this was 1974, they think that they have unearthed and put back together about 1,200 terracotta soldiers. They estimate there are 7,000 in the pit, 7,000. Now here's the site. So here's a tomb mound. Here's another picture of it that I mentioned to you that's kind of in the center. Just for sort of scale, this is an actual road that people drive on. It goes right through the middle. So this is 23 square miles. The terracotta warriors were off here to the east, several miles away. And we're going to talk about objects that most people know about the Terracotta Warriors and these three pits. And if you went to the site, you probably went to the museum of the Terracotta Warrior into the big airplane hangar, and you saw all of this. But in the last 10 years, new discoveries up here to the north, new discoveries down around this area of the tomb, around this area. So we're going to be showing in our exhibition objects that come from some of those new places, as well as the ones that come from here. And lots of people have speculated, but most historians agree today that the army was way out here because this was the area that was least defended. The Wei River ran kind of up here, so that was a nice defense. Over here was the capital city of Xianyang, so that was a protected area. And the mountains were down here to the south. So this was the area that was most vulnerable. So if you were going to have a big army of 7,000 life-size terracotta soldiers, you wanted it on that side where you might get attacked. This is, so those of you who've been there, this is the Museum of the Terracotta Warriors. I wanted to bring you a picture to give you a sense of scale, because this is incredible. So if you visit, you walk around the outside, and then you see all the pits. I believe this is pit two, and this is pit one. Isn't this incredible? Now let me explain it to you a little bit, because I find this absolutely fascinating. So <coughs> these are support walls. So basically, they created a giant underground room with these long hallways in it, OK? Very long hallways, little ways to get in from the edges. And then they took all the men in. They lined them all up. I, I, did, I wouldn't want to be the one who had to carry that first 400-pound warrior way back here, because <laughs> you had to come in from the edge. And then wood was laid across the top. So these are the support for the wood ceiling, grass mat on top of that, covered with earth. So now it's underground. And in that chaos and sort of revolution that happened when they killed the second emperor, his son, people came in and burned these pits because all these soldiers had real weapons. So sort of actual real weapons. Some have been found, but most were taken right at the time. So they came in, they took all the weapons, they set the place on fire, all the wood burned, everything caved in. So this is why they're not finding them whole. And I think it explains why it was kind of lost to time. They thought they'd done it in. And then 2,000 years later, when they're discovered, people are shocked because nobody had any memory because the people right at the time thought that they basically had destroyed the site. So back in here, you can see that things look a little messy, whereas here, they're all standing up. This is how they're found. And then they've got to put them back together. So when you come to see the exhibition, look closely at the figures. You're going to see all those breaks. This is a big jigsaw puzzle, which is why it's taking such an incredibly long time. There's another view. You can see that area much better here, where you're seeing the part that hasn't been really excavated yet. So here's a close-up view. And what's really incredible about them is the individuality of these faces. Look at all these different faces, each one looking a little different. This is a mastery of both automated and what's the, the assembly line process, as well as individualizing the figures at the end. 
They know of approximately eight molds for the heads, seven molds for the bodies, two molds have been found for the hands. So this was thousands of workers pressing clay into these molds, getting them to the finish line, and then a more skilled artisan coming behind and adding these details, changing the shape of the eyes and changing the shape of the nose and adding a mustache, creating an incredible hairdo, individualizing each figure. But yet it was mass produced to start with. It's, it's remarkable. And those of you who've been to the site can probably agree, and, and those who come to the exhibit will feel the same. You almost feel like you're looking into a real person's eyes. I mean, Michael and David came back saying it was really intense, because they got, they were very lucky. They got to go down on the floor with them, which very few people do. You know, you're always up on the edge, which is what's great about our exhibit. You can get right up close to them, look them in the eye. We also have a huge array of types of figures, which we were thrilled that the government allowed us to have. So we have this general, and you can tell him because he's got all these tassels and this incredibly elaborate headdress, and his armor, notice, is much smaller than, say, the infantryman here, because, of course, he would have wanted much more comfortable armor. This is an infantryman. We have him. This is a, a cavalryman. We also have his horse. and this. We have, this is not the one, but we have a kneeling archer which greets you at the exhibition. And I'm going to get to what's very special about him in a minute. But we also have a charioteer, a standing archer, an unarmed armor infantryman, and an, just a regular officer. It's a huge amount of figures to have left uh, China, the largest to come to the United States. And look at those headdresses. Is that amazing? Each one painstakingly created with these amazing, here's the general these incredible braids, each one is a little bit different. It's absolutely remarkable to think about the force of people who would have had to, to be available to create this army. And in such a short time, really, because he didn't live that long. Now, our kneeling archer doesn't have nearly as much pigment as this one. But it does have pigment. And we, I have to tell you, we're thrilled. Because it's the kind of thing you don't know until you unpack it. Because all the art left the British Museum, and it went back to China. And then things were changed up a little bit. And a slightly different group of objects, well, of similar you know, figures, came to Atlanta. And when we unpacked that archer and saw that red pigment still on him, and that pigment still on his face, we were amazed because it's very fragile. And we were thrilled that they decided to send it to us. It's only been in the last five years, working with German scientists, that the Chinese have figured out how to stabilize the lacquer layer on these figures in order to keep the pigment intact. Because what happened was, as I was telling you about how they were made, after they were finished, they were sent to be fired in the kiln. And when they came out of the kiln, they were painted with layers of lacquer and then pigment was placed on top of that. They were incredibly brightly colored, purple and yellow, red, green. I mean, they're just spectacular, uh, the colors that they're finding and what they think were made. And you can get a little bit of a sense of that, his wonderful facial color and the bits of red, darkness here. I mean, this figure clearly was part of the burning. You can see how dark he is. But now they figured out how to stabilize that fragile lacquer layer. And so the pigment is able to remain. Because before then, as soon as the air hit it, those lacquer layers just fizzled away and, and blew away. And so the color was disappearing. So it's incredible. So we have some horses. These horses are actually chariot horses. So they would have gone. And they, they, we don't have these in our exhibition. They were in the British Museum exhibition. But they would have been behind. There would have been four horses for each chariot. And they found you know, many chariots sort of behind the rows of infantrymen. The horse that we have has a saddle and was part of the cavalry. It's a wonderful horse. Each horse weighs about 800 pounds. And I'm going to show you a picture in a few minutes of how it was packed, because it's really fascinating. And then this is a figure that's really interesting. When it was first discovered, they actually thought they had found the first woman terracotta figure at the site. And they were really excited about it. But as they began to do more work and realized, well, what the pit they had uncovered was a stable, because as it turns out, he was sitting next to a box of hay, and then the skeleton of a real horse was there in front of him. And then they noticed he had a little mustache. <laughs> they decided, well, it was probably a stable boy or some kind of groom to care for the emperor's horses. And I have to tell you, thus far, not a single woman has been found. All the terracotta figures are men of all the different kinds. So here's that horse getting packed. Isn't this incredible? So this is, and this is the horse in our show. See how he's a saddle? 
So this is the cavalry horse that's in our show. I gotta tell you, even the horses seem to have this individualized face. There seems to be something like, you know, like looking in their face and their ears are perked up and they feel really real. But look at this, see how he's not standing on his base? This rigging is completely supporting him. This is the most fragile part of him, really, because this is more strong. And so he has to travel really sort of like in this sling, riding. And then before they put him in this big box back here, they actually bandage up the legs, completely wrapped like he had had a cast on him or something. And this is one of the slowest objects to install. So when the packers came and three folks from Xi'an came to help unpack the objects, once they got the horse on the platform safely with the rigging they needed, they all sort of see, re, high, sigh of relief, and then they felt, oh, the figures are going to be easy, you know. But the horse was really challenging. Now onto the new discoveries, because there are, have been many, many new discoveries at the site in the last 10 years. And what's incredible about these new discoveries is that they're telling us an enormous amount about the first emperor, things that people really hadn't understood before. Because he's always been thought of someone who was a conqueror, because he took over so much land and conquered. He's always considered very violent. Punishments under the first emperor were very severe. Things didn't go the way he wanted. The main punishment was you lost your head, or you went to prison. But Losing your head, I think, was sort of simpler, more straightforward, and sort of took care of business quickly. And so he was really thought to be very militaristic. But in these last 10 years, as more of these pits have been uncovered, what they're realizing is that there's a lot more to the first emperor and understanding the standardization. And so as we look at some of these discoveries, realize that it's this tomb site that's bringing this guy to life, because so much of the history had been lost up to that date. Right near the tomb mound in 1999, they found a pit that was an armory. No terracotta figures, no men, no people, no living or terracotta um, were found, all armor. And these pieces of armor, see how they're little squares of limestone? They found approximately 50,000 of these little pieces of limestone in this pit. And because of time, the copper wire that held them together, long gone, so it literally was just these 50,000 squares. An even bigger jigsaw puzzle, really, than the terracotta army. It takes about 600 pieces to make up the suit of armor, and then you have the helmet. And they found enough pieces in, you know, because they're sort of laying in their shape, kind of, that they know that there was armor for people and armor for horses, which is really incredible. Now, Nobody would be wearing stone armor in the real world. Would not be very protective. The first time you were sort of struck by something, it would probably all shatter. It's incredibly heavy. There's just nothing good about it. But for the afterlife, if you wanted to create armor that you wanted to have last forever, stone is a, a really good choice. And look, it, it has lasted. It's lasted really well, actually but incredibly tedious to make. Because each one of these little squares has to be hewn down to its proper shape. And then you've got to drill the holes in it. Not so many holes for this, but over here, there's about six holes in every single one. It's not easy, and with very simple tools, to drill a hole in limestone. For the most part, it cracks. So they had to really, they would drill from each side until they got to the middle. It was really tricky, very tedious. And there's 50,000 of these pieces. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So that's the armory. And then they found some pits, very, um, I, I pointed them out, and I'll show you that map again in a minute, sort of south of the tomb mound. And in, also in 99, not, uh, 11 acrobats were found in one pit. And so this means that the first emperor felt he needed some entertainment in the afterlife. And we know from other tomb sites that acro Chinese acrobats were very popular. This headless strong man, I'm sure he had a head originally, uh, is probably a strong man because if you, when you see him from the front, you'll see his muscles are really quite large. He's got kind of a strap kind of around his waist to help him be lifting something really heavy. So his job was probably to lift heavy things or hold up other acrobats as they were doing twirling and tumbling and things like that. He's really wonderful. And then here is a court official. And how fascinating that the first emperor felt that business would need to be done in the afterlife. He would need someone to take care of the paperwork and make sure that things. 12 of these civil officials have been uncovered to date. And they all have hanging down on their side a tool that makes us know for sure that they are officials. It's a little knife and a little whetstone. 
uh, because the people who needed that tool were people who were writing. There wasn't any paper. Paper hadn't been invented in 200 BC. And so they were writing on wood or on bamboo. And if there was a mistake, the knife was the eraser. And you would scrape off what you'd written, and you needed that whetstone to keep it nice and sharp. And in the exhibition, we have an actual knife and whetstone from the Qin Dynasty that's on view right near this figure so that you can compare it to what's hanging on his belt and really see uh, the accuracy of it. It's really terrific. And I wanted to show you this detail because until uh, I had seen this detail on a slide, I wasn't able to find it on the acrobat. It's right in this area. But he, he was also beautifully painted. And look at the designs that were on his. It must have been an incredibly fun and beautifully decorated costume that he was wearing because these little details are just terrific. So I encourage you to get close in, as close as those guards will let you lean over. They're very cautious. Um, and, and take a look in that little spot because these little details are there. And I noticed them this morning when I took a little tour through and I thought, wow, really is absolutely remarkable. And then finally, these objects come from a pit that is north of the tomb mound, at least a mile north of the tomb mound. That was, I hope that wasn't expensive. <laughs> Sale. <laughs> oh no. Um, just north of the tomb mound was a, a, a site that kind of is in the shape of an F. So it, the pit goes long like this, and then it makes a turn, and then it has another arm that comes down. So it's sort of a sideways F. And they diverted an underground river to go through this pit. And so the river goes in the shape of the, of the top of the F. And along that underground river were these life-size bronze water birds. We have two of them in the exhibition. This crane is one of them. The feathers, spectacular. They, too, would have been beautifully painted. And I encourage you, when you come to the exhibition, to notice his mouth, because he's got this wonderful, wriggly little fish right in his mouth, like he's just dipped down into that river and plucked it out. It's incredible. And then in this part of the F, this that made up the bottom part, were all these little cubby holes. And in each cubby hole was a terracotta figure. This is a seated musician here. We also have a kneeling musician in the exhibition as well. We have two musicians. I have to tell you, though, that there are really two camps on what these figures are. And we, of course, are in the British Museum camp. Um, and so those historians and curators and um, artists, art historians, all believe that these are musicians, that he was maybe playing some sort of a lyre or stringed instrument here, and that the bird maybe was even trained to dance, because it wasn't uncommon to try to train the animals to dance. And so this meditative and beautiful space where the emperor could come and see the birds and listen to the music. And then there's the fisherman camp. There's a whole other group of historians and Chinese scholars who think these guys are like that this guy's holding a, a row for an oar, right, to row his boat or something, and that he's some kind, and that the other guy, because we have a kneeling one, that he's maybe had a fishing pole. But since no instruments or no fishing poles survive, we don't know for sure. I will say in the favor of the musician camp, they have found some very small metal objects that could be a pick, you know, that you might have used to pluck a stringed instrument. So I think that lends a little more credence to the musician camp, so I feel good about being in the musician camp. But I know, you know, maybe it was a fishing tool. Could have been, right? <laughs> so let's go back to the site now that you've sort of seen everything and sort of get a feel for this 23 square mile site. So we've got the tomb site here. Up in this area were some uh, workshops and offices, and we even have some objects in the exhibition that come from this area because people lived here and made offerings to the emperor on a daily basis. And so we have some of the vessels that were used for that right in there. Then we had the armory, as I said, right over here. Here's the acrobat pit. The civil officials pit was right in here. They have found tombs of the workers that are just off to the side. Some very recent archaeology has gone on there. And we do have in the exhibition a few broken pieces of pottery with little scratches and writing on them that are definitely from people who were forced to create the emperor's tomb. About 700,000 people, they estimate it took to make it. Then we have the stables that were along in here. And then several miles away, the pits for the terracotta army. And then this most recent discovery in 2000, 2001, the pit for the bronze birds and the musicians. Now, most people say 
Wow, so when are they gonna open that tomb? I mean, how are we gonna find out what's in that incredible tomb? All we have is that information from that historian writing 100 years later, talking about the rivers of mercury and the concubines and the bows and arrows. But the Chinese feel very serious that they are not gonna open that tomb or go in until they're prepared to deal with what they find and they don't feel they're gonna cause any harm because They've got 600 open pits at this 23 square mile site right now. They've only excavated 1,200 of 7,000 warriors. They've got a lot of archaeology on their hands, and they don't want to add something new until they feel that they're ready. But they are trying to do things in a non-destructive way. So for example, they've taken soil samples on the tomb mound, and there's very high levels of mercury in that soil, which don't exist in the soil around. So maybe there's some truth to the rivers of mercury. They've also done some sort of, um, I guess it would be like more like sonar kind of looking into the mountain. And they have a good sense of sort of how deep down the tomb is underground, how open the space is. So they've begun to investigate. But when I was in London at the British Museum at a study day there, the director of the Terracotta Museum was asked, you know, are you gonna open that tomb? When are you gonna do it? And he said, not in my lifetime. So I think it's a long way away. I think they're going to proceed with, with great caution. So I brought just a few other slides to, to remind you of what an incredible time it is in Atlanta and how much amazing art is here right now, which is really incredible. We have this Victorian Albert show. It's about 20 incredible works of art from the medieval and renaissance collections of the Victorian Albert Museum. We would not have this if the V&A hadn't decided to completely overhaul their medieval and renaissance collections and so were able to travel their finest treasures at the museum now till January 4th. Louvre Atlanta, the final year, just opened about a month ago, and we've got incredible masterpieces from all three collecting departments at the Louvre, including this gorgeous ciborium used for holding the host in the Catholic service, this amazing Islamic bassin that was made in the, Midi in the Middle Ages, sorry, made in the, in the Islamic world and in the Middle Ages sometime taken to France and used to baptize the kings of France in from Louis XIII up to Napoleon III's son, incredible. This Vermeer, one of the only signed Vermeers, there's three signed Vermeers in the world of the 35 that we know are really Vermeers, and this one is in Atlanta right now and just until February, so you don't want to miss it. And because he's got to go back, they don't want to have him gone. They only have two Vermeers at the Louvre, so it's got to go back. And then this beautiful Greek sculpture from about 620 BC, Kava Domdoser, and she has an incredible story, which I will not spoil for you, and you can come and see it at the museum. And I have to, of course, acknowledge that also the Treasures of King Tut is also in Atlanta now. So what an absolutely incredible and amazing time uh, for Atlanta and how exciting that is. Of course, we also have tons of programming, so I encourage you to come down and, and check that out. I am very happy to answer questions about the First Emperor Show. I've got lots of information in my head, but I was told to talk for about this amount of time, so I, I don't want to keep you all night. But you can see that I am really excited and think that this is a terrific opportunity. And um, I'll be happy to talk a little more and answer some questions. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Do you think the lacquer was wet when they applied the pigment? How, how, how is that? How do they relate to each other? I don't know the answer. It's a really good question. I don't know how they did it. I know it's several layers of lacquer, and so that makes me think it would have had to dry before another layer was applied. But then I don't know about the addition of the, of the pigment. It certainly does seem embedded in the lacquer because it goes with it, you know, when the lacquer, you know, frizzles up and, and goes away. And, and, and that would have been... Would it have been fired again or just no. cold? That's right. It would have just been left to dry. That's right. It was not fired again. The firing of the warriors, do you have, do you have any idea whether they're like high fire? I mean, as far as terracotta goes, yep. are they fired on the low side and very fragile, or are they fired more on the high side, more like stoneware? Or? I don't know the specific answer to that question. I do know that they're incredibly, you know, They've lasted this incredible time. And I mean, the reason they broke is because, you know, all that earth fell in on top of them. But the pieces themselves that have stayed t together are thick 
and, and very, very strong. And Shane Portal, the curator at the British Museum, says of all of the different clays that they might have chosen to use to make this terracotta out of, they did choose a clay that was the most durable. Um, and she, I don't remember the name of it, but she talks about this very specific kind of clay they chose to use and how incredibly durable it is. But those are good, uh, good sort of sculpture questions that I don't know the answer to. Sorry. <laughs> yes. I think the people who actually do the work, you know, are Chinese archaeologists. But I certainly know that, say, for example, Hiromi, um, the woman who's been working with us, who's a, also an archaeologist and historian, she's been able to visit the sites. They're able to go in the pits and they're able to look and talk. But I don't know that they actually conduct any of the digging. Yeah. Yes. How did the Germans get connected I think they had already been doing a lot of research about, you know, uh, color on uh, clay objects, and so I think they were sought out. Um, but there's a really good article about it in the catalog, so there's some really good information about that relationship. You use the word standardized mm -hmm. um, in terms of this emperor, and you said he standardized commerce in terms of the money, mm -hmm. and then he standardized in terms of all the provinces the language. What about the written language? He only standardized the written language, oh, not the not spoken the language. language. It's not the verbal, it was the written language. He standardized the characters. Before him, there might have been six different characters for horse, okay. and he made there be one character for horse. Okay, so it's the written. It's the written. So still, in speaking to one another, even today, there are so many different dialects, but even still today, they all can read the same written oh, okay. language. Yeah. What about the there are two carriages in the exhibition, and I don't show them because they're reproductions. And I like to make that very clear to everybody. When those little carriages were discovered in the pits, they're all made of bronze, and they're very badly damaged and crushed. And while they have sort of put them back together, and I think you can see them when you go to Xi'an, they're very delicate, and they don't travel. So the Museum of the Terracotta Warriors hired someone, and in fact, the man they hired was one of the packers that we met, um, who made these incredibly accurate and detailed bronze reproductions of the chariots. And so two of those are in the exhibition, but I do want to make clear that they're, they are the reproductions in the show. The, uh, everything else is real. But they're half-size chariots, and that's what they were in the tomb. They were made half-size, um, which is absolutely remarkable to think that, you know, well, you know, in the afterlife, they could probably just blow up and be the proper size. <laughs> yes? Um, on the map that you showed us, mm -hmm. Up in here? Um, do they suspect that there may be other pits there that... I think they think there are more, but, you know, lots of people live here. And so one of the challenges is, you know, like people live in here, and people live in here. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> so it is a challenge, yes. You said that they've uncovered about 1,200 and they think there's 7,000. Right. Where does that assumption come from? The size. So they've been able to, you know, so they've dug. So like in this picture... I can get back there quickly. You can see, this is better maybe. You know, this is how many they've put together, right? But all of this is still so that's broken. Just one pit that and that's just pit one. Mm -hmm. And there's, the pit one is the biggest. That's where all the lined up infantrymen, and this is like a space where a chariot was. And then there's a smaller pit that was sort of a command post where some of the generals have been found. And then another pit that's filled with more of archers and crossbowmen. Um, but they, 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 the estimate comes from that they think they've uncovered the size of it. You know, so they, they think they have a good sense of the size of those pits. Yes? How have um, Emory University, the Confucius Institute, and the Chinese community here in Atlanta uh, been engaged or responded to this uh, exciting Exhibit. They have been incredibly supportive. The folks at the Confucius Institute at uh, Emory uh, helped us to plan our teacher institute, provided a lot of the lectures and study groups um, and materials that the teachers got. One 
uh, it was a two-part institute, one that happened November 1st, and the second part will be on Saturday. So they've been terrific in helping us do that. And uh, there's a huge Chinese community in Atlanta and a, a wide range of groups. I don't want to try to list them all off because I'll get all their names wrong. But I did give a, a tour yesterday um, in the exhibition, a private tour to members of all of those different groups to thank them for how incredibly supportive they have been in l getting the word out and helping us with translations and making connections with people. They've just been terrific. And I met a lot of them yesterday on this private tour, and we just had a, a great time together. And I kept saying to them, I know I'm telling you stuff you already know, but <laughs> if I say Chin Shir Wan Di wrong, please tell me. And <laughs> but they've been wonderfully supportive. It's been great. And yesterday at the press conference, Jimmy Carter was there along with the ambassador to the United States from China um, and a huge delegation from Xi'an and the Shanxi province where Xi'an is. Um, there must have been 10 people from China who were there. And what an incredible response. And, and for them to be so excited. And I have to tell you, they did ask for lots of details about our exhibition and how it looks. So I felt like, gosh, even they think it's better than the British Museum. <laughs> Anybody else? One more. You know, it's very interesting. There is an American tour, and this exhibition, I should say these objects, came to Atlanta from the Bowers Museum in Los Angeles. But th we have a relationship with the British Museum, and the story the British Museum told and the story we're telling is the same, and we're using that catalog. The Bowers, the Houston Museum of Science and Technology and the National Geographic in Washington, D.C. are all getting these objects, but they're telling the story differently, more from that sort of science and history perspective, whereas the British Museum and we came at it more from an art museum perspective. So yes, their objects are touring, but I think if you went to Houston, for example, you'd feel like you were seeing a little bit of a different show because they're telling it differently. So thank you, Spaulding. <laughs>